this morning. Hey, this one may drag a little bit. I hope you'll stick around. Uh, what I want to talk about is the origin of, I'm going to call it the natural number limit definition of Euler's constant. By that, I mean E, the famous number E, approximately 2.718. Now, um, let me just kind of cut to the chase a little bit here. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about the, the limit definition. There's two of them. I'm actually going to prove this one for you and then show you that this form follows pretty quickly, this form right over here. Now, this is in the algebra, you know, algebra in college, maybe pre-calculus in college, high school. Um, this is very much related to the continuous compound interest formula. The one that you guys remember, amount is equal to principal times E raised to the RT, where R is the rate, interest rate, T is the time. Some people remember by PERT. I'm going to show you, this is often just given to you in the textbooks as a, as a definition, which is shocking to me, with very little foundation on what where this magical limit comes from. And they, they will, the, I know that when I taught it, I would show them a graph of this, and you could see that it had a horizontal asymptote approaching this value E. And so that gave you some visual insight, but really, you know, it, it's connected to the compound interest formula when the number of compounding periods increase without bound in the regular compound interest formula. But anyway, let's get back to why this is true. Okay, now, uh, why wouldn't you expect me to call f of x equal ln x? ln x and the e to the x are inverses of each other, right? So in other words, what I mean by that is ln of e to the x is equal to x, and then e raised to the ln x is equal to x. And we're making the assumption here that uh, it's not that big a deal as far as the proof, but the domain of ln x is uh, zero to infinity, zero not included. And uh, this property right here ends up being super important. It's, in fact, this is how I got stuck when I was doing this. But it's, it's pretty well known that if you have a function ln x, it's derivative given by f prime is one over x. So what we do is we actually set two things equal to each other that are known to be equal, but they look different, if that makes any sense. So F prime at one right here is actually equal to one, All right? That's not too hard for us, is it? You put a one right there, you get one back, right? But this is also equal to what we call the limit definition. Now, y'all, I'm using the letter N. H gets used a lot. The letter H, don't know how it got so popular, you know? But I'm using the letter N to let you know that even though it's a continuous variable, we normally think about this in terms of a natural number one, two, three, four, et cetera. Now, the first big under the first big step here to simplify this is F at one. F at one, okay, if you take a one and substitute right here, you get zero back. The natural log of one is zero. The the, the log base anything of one is equal to zero since that something raised to zero is equal to one. That just goes back to laws of the exponents. Now notice, so all of a sudden, this since this piece is equal to zero, we get to this piece right here. Now notice we're still keeping the limit going on. Um, now, uh, it's incredible how much of the so-called hard mathematics gets back to just what I call foundational or first principle arithmetic. Dividing by n is the same as multiplying by one over n. You know, dividing by something same as multiplying by its reciprocal. It gets back to that stuff you learned in middle school. You just don't know to apply it here. Now that's where this rule comes in. You see, uh, this M right here actually is behaving like a factor or a multiplier right here. Uh, this is a property of, it, of any log function, not just the natural log function where the exponent drifts around to the front here. So we, we went reverse, it was already at the front, so we put it inside, all right? Now this is another sort of pet peeve of mine. The parentheses is not overkill here. If you didn't put the nested parentheses, you'd get an incorrect statement. It would, you'd be taking the uh, nth root of the output of the function. You're supposed to be taking the nth root of the input of the argument of the function. So these, these parentheses are crucial and many teachers just out of laziness, indolence, or not even knowing, don't, don't even do this. But this is absolutely crucial right here to do this. Now, the last part of this proof exploits the fact that e to the x and ln x are inverse functions. So what we do, it, it, it's a property, and I'm not proving this, but if, you, if you're dealing with continuous functions, you can take the limit inside, all right? That's, a, that's probably an epsilon delta proof or something, but we're just gonna take it as a fact. But if you do e to the ln, 
you do e to the ln, you see how no longer do you see an ln right here, but we don't have one anymore. We have e to the one, isn't that cool? Isn't that so cool? All right, that's it folks. That's how that gets proved. Now I'm not being so careful here. Really this should be as n approaches zero from the right, but it's not really a big deal only because the natural log function has a domain zero to infinity. Now, so y'all, th this, this is your definition of E following from calculus. It's in, in the basic idea was to look at the derivative evaluated at one from two different perspectives. You see how we have the one here? Okay, that's really this one, that's that one there. We already know what the derivative is equal to from the relationship with the natural log function, but we also know that this is its limit definition. And that's what we're interested in, a limit definition of, of E. And so it, it's not, it's a, you can call it a definition, but really it follows from more, from, from some fairly heavy duty calculus, All right? Now, what this does, let's, let's kind of, uh, I don't know, let's, let's make this thing a little less mysterious. This says is n approaches zero, right? So what I did is I tried out one, right? See, look at this one, one's close to zero, right? All right, now, when you put one in here and here, you actually get two which is a very crude approximation of E. E's known to be somewhere around 2.718. It's irrational, which is an interesting proof also. All right, now, so I, okay, that's not good enough for us. So let's try Let's try a number a little closer. Let's try one half, right? Okay, one half. Now again, if you take this one half and pop it right in the slot here, notice we're, we're defanging this thing. That's the word I was looking for. We're not, we're not worried about the limit. We're trying to get concrete approximations of what this number E is actually equal to. All right, so if you put one half in here, you, this one over one half becomes the two that you see right there. So we get nine over four. Now that's 2.25. I didn't, I didn't write the decimal on that, the decimal expansion of re representation. But anyway, that's getting a little closer to 2.7, right? So let's get even closer, one fifth, right? One fifth, again, you can follow what I'm doing right here. I took the one fifth and just put it right in here. And this is what we got, all right? And already, even with just n equals one fifth, we're getting a pretty good sized fraction, which could be done by hand. I, and I want to emphasize that, folks. No mysterious cal calculators are needed here, even though it would be a pain in the ass to, to do the long division on this. It is something you could do if you were predisposed during COVID, quarantine somewhere, you know, self-isolation, whatever. You could actually take the time to do this and show this, right? All right. And now I, I just for grins, I wanted to show you how ridiculous this gets. Look, that's that's close to zero, isn't it? Look, n approaches zero, n approaches zero, one twentieth is pretty much hugging zero, right? All right. And so when you do the work, you get this kind of pattern that you already noticed over here. It's six over the number, but then you raise it to the number, right? Right here, this is twenty-one over the number, but you raise it to the number, the denominator, right? And now I got to admit, I used something, I used some assistance. I certainly didn't want to, I, I'm not self-isolating. I got other things to do, like watch the Astros lose in the World Series. But this is, um, this is a huge fraction here that turns out to be much closer to the 2.718. Uh, Again, this is the closest we could get. And these are crude rational number approximations, but they are rational number approximations. Don't you, isn't it nice to know you can get E in terms of some fraction, if you want to. Uh, again, hardly anybody does this anymore. They just use their calculator and, and hope that it's, it's it, it, that it's producing the truth. But this is this is much closer to the 2.718. And again, you could, you, for your own interest, you could try 100 and not, please don't give me this fraction. I, I, I did that, just I got that from the, you know, from software somewhere, you know. But in any event, uh, Let's go back one more time and take a look at these two definitions, which we proved, these limit definitions. This is the one I just proved for y'all right here. Now, uh, I do want to stress that both of these forms are in the form, what they call indeterminate one raised to the infinity. Um, and again, wh what does that mean even? It doesn't mean you're really trying to raise one to the infinity. If there's any justice, that would be one, right? But this expression is in the form one to the infinity, and yet we got something that's not equal to one, right? So that kind of this is a description of a limit. It's not. It's not a really an arithmetic computational thing, all right? So, um, but again, one more time. If, if, if as n approaches zero, this this part approaches one. One over a smaller and smaller number is going to 
uh, is unbounded or approaches infinity. So this is definitely in the form one to the infinity. Now this is the little switcheroo right here. Think of just replacing n with one over x, all right? You would get this, you would get one over x raised to the x, right? And I just changed the variable there. So these are equivalent, all right? As, as n approaches infinity, this piece right here does go to zero. I mean, go to one, excuse me, that piece goes to zero as n gets large, right? And you still got the one hanging around. And then of course, this is infinity. So this is the one that's related to the continuous compound interest formula. The, um, I'm gonna take the time, folks. I, if, you, if you hang up on me, that's fine. Um, what do we got here? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, y'all, I'm trying to, I wanna write down um, something here for you. Y'all remember this, this actually, this what we call continuous compound interest formula, amount equals to principal, all right, this is another video which I wanna do soon. A lot of people just remember this as PERT, but this is the same E, Euler, German guy named Euler. I think the guy went blind and kept doing math. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, R, T like this, okay, y'all seen that one? This is the continuous compound interest formula. And um, E is the, yours truly. R would be the interest rate and T would be the number of time, I guess, in years, okay? So anyway, that's what that's all about. Uh, but uh, let me, uh, I clear this? Okay, I'll leave that there. Now I'm gonna clear it, folks, get it go away. Yeah, now, and again, since I've already taken up a lot of your time, uh, I'm gonna continue to do that. Let's go back. I just wanna stress what the big idea was. We found the derivative two different ways. That's the beauty of this thing. We, we use two different representations of the derivative. One is the, the one over x form where we easily get f prime at one is equal to one. But then this is your limit definition. Remember f of a plus h minus f of a over h. I just used the letter n. n is still a continuous variable, but I usually think of it in this context as a natural number one, two, three, four, and so on, okay? So y'all, I hope you enjoyed it. I know nobody stayed for the end of this thing. But this, to me, this is cool. It's not just some made up thing they put in algebra and pre-calculus books. It does originate from calculus. Thanks for listening.